Lime Books present Overpopulation by Robert Salisbury. Episode 6 Confucius 1. Scene 1 Operation Vitellius. Second move. Banks was on the phone to McQuirk at Reuters. They're not biting, explained McQuirk. Hmm, it was something he had anticipated. I'm sending something over. Any more cigars? Get China to deny they have trouble with their batteries, and I'll take you to Havana myself. Banks sent over the information, and McQuirk set up video on his boardroom. He gathered the cream team round and informed them. Listen up, guys, listen up. We've just received this. The lights were dimmed. Video on the wall showed men in white spacesuits drifting in a weightlessness in a confined space. They spoke in muffled Chinese. Subtitles had been added. Beijing, this is Confucius One. We have a problem. It was short. McQuirk stood and as if he were a conductor setting his musicians, he wafted his palms to calm them. Okay, guys, guys, calm down. You saw it. Lin, have you heard anything from China? No statement from China, she confirmed. Why don't we just publish the video? asked Rodrigo. Protected source, guys. You saw the video. Somebody knows something. Lin. Have you talked to all of your contacts? Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, quiz them all. Confucius Swan is in trouble, Lin. If we don't break the news, it breaks us. Okay, guys, off you go. Find me something. It was a mass scramble for devices, phones and coffee, as the cream team evacuated McQuirk's office. Scene 2. Panic for Succession Banks joined Billy, the professor and maid, around Lord Martin's bed. Will he be all right, professor? asked Banks. How long has he been out? The professor rasped his chin and made deep purring noises. About three hours, confirmed maid, tucking the sheets in. Billy seemed unconcerned. What about Henry? Any chance he will be released? Unlikely, replied Billy. One of his boys informed his tutor, who informed the police. Normally, the right handshake would have silenced things, but the times they are a-changing, and Henry is for the top knot. The Lord groaned. Everyone leaned in to hear better. Who would have thought? mumbled the Lord. Thought what? asked Billy. Henry, a kitty fiddler. What, Henry who lives with nine-year-old boys? Billy didn't like Henry either. I'll not have Henry back after this. Someone will have to take over his portfolio. Relax, George, the professor consulted his chart. You need to rest. You have had a virus. At your age can take a while to recover. Nonsense, I'm as fit as a fiddle. I did 100 press-ups earlier. When? 1966, I think it was. Oh, just be quiet. I will not be quiet. In fact, I'm going. Lord Martin swung a leg out of the bed. Maid pressed against it, attempting to prevent him from rising from his bed. Now, my lord, it's for your own good. Poor Maid was as loyal a staff as Lord Martin had ever had. Get out of my way! Just then, Lady Elizabeth opened the door and entered. How is my darling poopy poop? Get that woman out of here. Calm down, George, encouraged the professor. Out, out, you, 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 you. He worked himself into a frenzy. How could you, George? I love you. Is not my love as pure as rain, as soft as water? If your love be rain, then I drown in your care. My liege, I only wish for your care. I only care for your leave. Oh, the troubles of a wife, did ever a heart bleed so in vain? 
Thrice this morning did she put a pillow over my head and attempt to expel from me that very breath which delivers life. Be gone, foul witch, before the dragon of my wrath smites thee, you Regan, you Goneril, you Lady Macbeth. While Maid, Billy and Banks attempted to physically subdue the Lord, Lady Elizabeth pirouetted delicately away from his bedside. I was merely rearranging his linen, making him more comfortable. Uh, please, ma'am, Professor employed a gentle arm around the lady. Can't the wife attend to her husband? In his gentlest voice, the professor advised, The Lord must rest. Fine, fine, everyone against me as usual. Have it your way. I shall wait in my quarters. Come harry me the moment he dies, and woe betide anyone who disobeys. Exit Lady Elizabeth. An hour later, the Lord stepped from his bed and arched his back. The action produced a series of knuckle-cracking pops, causing all present to wince. I fear Henry's case must be put before ceremony, Philip. You shall take charge. I bestow upon you full executive powers. Mark I, study your father's text, and when the flame which so burnt in his eye doth warm your conscience, we shall know the fate of this world. Cease not your quest, for the gold doth exist. Lo, like love, for those not infected by it, tis but a cold ham. Wherefore those diseased of it shall glow like nectar, as to warm all around them. The Lord raised a pointed finger in the air. And now! The professor slipped a needle into him, and he sat like steel. All but his eyes, which rolled in their sockets, accusing all they saw, until he blacked out and fell to the bed. He will sleep, yawned the professor. Pint, anyone? Billy was his usual phlegmatic self. Scene 3. The Lion, Wadstone Village. Billy ordered two pints at the bar whilst explaining Bruce Lee's two-finger punch. So, Bruce places two fingers, like the crane, see? Here, one inch from your solar plexus, see? Then... He launches, but he is so fast that you don't see it coming. Next thing, you're on your back. Fascinating. Seriously, how does it feel to be CEO? 250,000 staff at your disposal. With Henry locked away, you're in control. Practically a shadow, you know. You know the first thing we're going to do? Get pissed. No, deal with Henry. Ah, uh, yes, of course. And then? Get pissed? No. Vitellius. We will deal with Vitellius. Well, I'll drink to that. Two pints were placed on the bar. Banks was about to pay when Billy said, No need. The Lord owns it. What, the pub? No, the village. They moved to the fireplace. Not bad. What's it called? Blenheim Ale. 5.2%. Yeah, very good. Where's Tinai? He's probably keeping an eye on me. We're in the Lion, Tuesday afternoon. Look around, there's no one here. There were two other people in the bar. Five people sat at tables and one at the fruit machine. Banks stood and addressed them all. Tinai! Everyone stopped and stared at him. What are you shouting for? He's not here, Phil, said Billy. If the authority Lord Martin gave me is real, he'll be here. Banks shouted at the top of his voice, Tinai! Come out wherever you are! Steady, Phil, you'll get us thrown out. Tinai appeared at the doorway and strolled over to where they sat. Would you like a drink? I never drink on duty, sir. His Scottish accent was hard but not thick. His expression flat but not cold. Banks swallowed more ale. Make sure Henry doesn't do a runner. He couldn't survive in prison. Tinai responded with a nod. Do you have any leads on Zara? No, sir. Banks observed Tinai as one does an unresponsive cat. 
mystified by its calm disinterest. All normal indicators were misleading or missing. You shouldn't worry, sir. Why is that? She'll likely return. Why would you say that? I don't know, sir. Do you know something? I know nothing, sir. Banks knew that Tinai was a model of discretion. There were secrets he would keep to the grave. Tinai had saved his skin before. He was a stalwart in their lives, a single, unattached man who lived for nothing more than to serve DM. He had no family, no friends, and no activities outside of work. He worked 24-7 and never took holiday. I trust you, Tinai. Thank you, sir. I looked at your file. You used to work on steam engines in India. Speak Russian, don't you? I do, sir. You had a son. If you don't mind me seeing so, sir, it has nothing to do with you. There was a tense silence. Banks decided to overlook the impertinence. All right. Do you know the Kharkiv locomotive factory in the Ukraine? They have a P-36. A beautiful engine, if I may say so, sir. I believe it used to pull the Red Arrow Express. Aye, Moscow to Leningrad. They're rebuilding her. How would you like to spend time working on her? I wouldn't know, sir. Deal with Henry, and I will introduce you. Spend as long as you like there. Would that be all, sir? Tin I left the pub. Billy was impressed. You total boss! Banks's phone rang. Hello? Uh, with Billy, yes. Uh, contact our lawyers. Ring fence Henry's boys. Ask my foster parents in Canada to find them good homes. Hmm. Tomorrow, yes. Bye, Leone. Billy downed his pint. Another Blenheim? Scene 4. Global Reset Philip Banks's promotion to CEO at Delange Martin changed everything. His office, his duties, his power, and above all, perception of who he was. Upon arrival at DM offices the next day, he was whistled through security to Henry's office on the 64th floor, which now bore his name. It had been filled with his books and belongings from his old office on the lower floors. The DM legal team were waiting for him, there to officiate his signing of legal documents transferring immense authority from Henry to himself. Oh, what's this one about? Corporate liability. And this? Your pass. Wait a minute, it, it says Prasuticus. What is that? Don't worry, it will all be explained. Banks signed non-stop for over five minutes. Each document, detailed in triplicate, with no explanation offered on any of them. Once finished, they left him with the pen as if it were a consolation prize, and vacated his office. Alone, in Henry's grand office, he considered what it was to climb higher, to feel more in charge. It didn't feel as he had thought it would. He felt as railroaded as he had done on his first day. What was clear was the immense authority he now welded as CEO. Something he was excited to test. If as a director he had had a spud gun, as CEO, he was Zeus with his own nuclear-pronged trident. He slipped out of the bathroom and was followed by security. Two men in suits waited for him and followed him back to his office as he returned. Are they my castle wall or my prison guards? He thought. His new authority put people on edge. Though they were some exceptions, such as Billy, who was just his usual jovial self. Billy, what's all this about Prasutagus? Insurance policy. Isn't it a satellite? Sort of. 
Billy rarely kept things from banks, so his vagueness both irritated and stoked his curiosity. What the fuck are you talking about? OK, you'll find out soon enough. Next week, Operation Global Reset. Which is? Let's just say that for precaution, we have to make ourselves scarce. Next Tuesday, we fly to Ponta Delgada, take the shuttle to Prasutagas, then we're off to the moon. The moon? Yes. Billy supped his beer, as cool and sober as he could be. George nuked it in the 80s. I'm told they have lakes and food there now. Anyway, you're coming. Next week. There we go. We stay a while. We come back. Safe. What do you mean, safe? I'm not going to the moon. You have to. You'll enjoy it. It'll be a blast. Prasuticus is like a liner in space. Loads to do. Who else is coming? Um, about 200. Mainly friends of the shadows. Usual suspects. Reuben, Peter, Rashid, Lee, the Pope. A few managers. Sir Thomas Longbow. Henry. I thought Henry was in prison. Special circumstance. It's a global reset. Millions will be infected. Uh, we need to be away. How can you say that calmly? Just doing my job. So was Himmler. Oh, no. This isn't the doing of my father's book, is it? The final solution. He's not saying that he wants to eradicate people, is he? Billy could see that Banks was struggling. It's my father's book, isn't it? No, Phil, no. Your father's book is a poem. Doesn't mean a thing. Then why does everybody want to know? Forget about it. There will be a virus. It will last 24 hours. 22 is overseeing it. It will pass through the water supply and go airborne. It's a one-off impact. But just be safe, we'll escape for 10 days. Banks had almost guessed as much. But as Billy detailed what was to happen in plain terms, he could not believe it. Is it lethal? Billy looked tired. It's serious, Phil. I'm not joking. Fuck it. No, this is crazy. We have to stop it. Forget it. It's out of our hands. It sounds like it's in our hands. I know, I know. Billy leant forward in conspiratorial fashion and murmured, Zara will be coming too. You know where she is? Look, where is she? Is she okay? Calm down, Phil. She's fine. I'm only telling you because... I'm a savant. You're the CEO, and when Sarah returns, she gets a free pass too. Why, because she's my wife? No, because she is related to the Prince of Darkness. Fuck off, Rashid. Yes, Al-Fahim. You didn't know? Of course I didn't know. He was chatting to me about tea leaves not a week ago. Sarah, related to him? You'll inherit a packet. She's in direct line. Billions, my friend. And you now control Lord Martin's stake, too. That makes you two one of the richest couples on the planet. This is a wind-up, right? No, I'm being serious, Phil. How long have you known Zara was all right? Look, Phil, you know how it is. You bastard. Where is she? I don't know. Honestly, I don't. Believe me, she's fine. Is there anything else you would like to tell me? Well, it is your round. Scene 5. Who sank the Wushan? Reuben Segal was distressed. As CEO of Morgan Sachs, he was shouldering the problems of their debt, which had reached colossal heights. As the American shadow he also had the entire economy of the North American continent in his hands, an economy being propped up by debt, phony contracts and zombie banks through various arrangements with the other shadows, primarily Lord Martin. Premier Li Xiaoping and Peter Nikolai were putting him under pressure, which he was feeling. It was the first time they had met since Banks's promotion to DMCEO. Congratulations, Phil. One of the team. He was calling about the other big news of the day, the sinking of a Chinese warship 
off the coast of Vietnam's Long Hai Island in the East China Sea. So, did you sink the Wushan? No, Reuben, we did not. World stock markets had plunged on the news. The expectation of a retaliation by China had pushed the red dollar off a cliff edge, whilst the US dollar had rallied. The Vietnamese Navy had claimed a responsibility, stating that they had opened fire after the captain of the Wushan refused to leave Vietnamese territorial waters. It was the story the world's media were running with. The Vietnamese were lapping it up. However, Billy had intelligence from the Thai Navy confirming that Vietnam had no capability in range at the time of the Chinese ship sinking. China blamed the US, stating that they had been fired on without warning whilst in their own territorial waters. This also proved to be untrue which left a gaping hole in the story. As Ruben Segal put it, If you didn't do it, the Vietnamese didn't do it, and the Chinese didn't do it, and we certainly didn't do it. Who the hell did? I've spoken with Peter. He's none the wiser. Japan wouldn't do it. Banks decided it was time to use his executive prerogative. Australia, they did it. Reuben was incredulous. He questioned why they would do such a thing, especially in view of the arsenal China had built up recently. Would not like to be in Prime Minister Green's shoes if China ever finds out. We should probably leak it. Leak it? What the hell would we do that for? Keep China busy while we prepare? Prepare for what? War. Are you mad? We aren't gonna start a war with Lee. He got more fucking hardware than Amazon got books. Even we shoot him out of the sky, they're gonna bury us in scrap metal. If the Chinese hit Australia, they will hit you too. They ain't gonna hit us. They ain't, they ain't gonna hit Australia neither because we ain't gonna tell them. You might not, but I shall. Banks was beginning to enjoy the freedom of absolute authority. And when the Chinese find out that Australia sank their ship, they will bomb you first. What do you mean, bomb us first? A strike on Australia assumes that the US will come to their defense. If you are going to be involved, they will strike you first. Banks let that sink in. Unless. Unless what? Unless you strike them first. You got a whole new spin on this special relationship. I suggest you hit China and hit her hard. Or Prime Minister Green will find shrapnel from your missile of the Wushan all over Bondi Beach. Banks closed communication. Banks could feel his blood running easier. He felt a little light-headed and called Leone. She had also been relocated to the 64th floor. She walked into his office between the row of life-sized flamingos that ran from the entrance to Henry's red leather-top desk, where Banks now sat. I'd like you to send an urgent message to the British Prime Minister. Tell him we have evidence that Australia sacked the Wushan. Tell him it's about to leak. If he acts quickly, he can warn Nathan Green. The Australian Prime Minister, sir? Yes. He'll need to prepare his people. Uh, actually, on second thoughts, no. I'll tell him myself. Better that way. Yes, Mr. Banks. Hey, Leone, it's me. Sorry, Philip. They told me... Well, you know. She smiled awkwardly. Thank you, Leone. He looked at the walls painted with a man in a black tuxedo riding bareback on a white unicorn on the shoreline of a yellow sandy beach. And can you get the decorators in? Henry's taste is too gay for my liking. I want damask wallpaper, something from Archibald Knox. Is that possible? With me, anything is possible. And let's ditch the flamingos. Yes, Philip. Leone left. Banks tapped at his desk. 
His words were the catalyst for major events. If he said something, things happened. It was a strange sensation. He had spent the majority of his life thinking about what should or could be done. Now he held the power and resources to make almost anything happen. It was intoxicating. He sent a message to Mads Arsvik, whom he had not contacted since their meeting in Nigeria. News on Zara? The reply came immediately. Someone had gone to great lengths to hide her, which means they are pros and that she is alive. Dead people don't cover their tails so thoroughly. Banks sat back in his chair to consider. He decided to feed Mads a scoop. Australian Collins class submarine. Sydney Cove sank Wuzhan. Leak to press. No source. No reference. Confirm once done. Mads replied. Understood. I have a second project for you. We must meet. I will send instructions shortly. Mads confirmed. Banks gazed through the window from Henry's office. The scale and geometry of the city's architecture had transformed in recent years. Is this what I am to live like from now on? He thought. He called David Noble, the British Prime Minister. Noble was in his second term in office. He had been through many phases, naive at first, then rebellious, and now, more recently, resigned to fate. Good afternoon, Philip. Prime Minister, Lord Martin sends his regards. Banks was mindful that his employer's health was of national significance. He is improving. I am encouraged to hear that. I am in charge now. Banks was aware that the PM would be highly interested in DM's view on the Vietnam-China situation, which would be most likely as a reason for his call. Did we sink the Wushan? Certainly not. The PM was offended. Do you know who did? We're looking into it. Do you know who did it? What if I were to tell you that an Australian submarine sank the Wushan? <laughs> that I seriously doubt. It has been confirmed. Do you have any evidence? Collins class submarine, Sydney Cove. Ballistic missile from 12 kilometers. We traced her from Papua New Guinea along the coast of Vietnam. Good God! Are they working for the US? It seems so. Why didn't they tell us? I was speaking to Nathan just yesterday. Looks like they want Australia to be implicated. Poor Nathan. What was he thinking? If this gets out, Australia will be done for. They can rely on your support, though. Britain's support. What? Support? Britain? We're not going to war with China. We didn't sink the Wushan. But you support Australia. Well, not in the ashes, but, uh, well, we are not going to war against Premier Xiaoping. He's only just visited. The king honoured him with a knighthood. China-UK relations have never been so good. Besides, they are the only ones with any money these days. So you are going to desert Australia in her hour of need? No, no Australians are our cousins. We will offer them all the encouragement and support possible. Good, so we'll strike first. Strike? Who? China. Are you mad? There have been more soldiers than we have civilians. Their technology is light years ahead of ours. What about your nuclear submarines? Polaris is older than my son, and he's just graduated. Most of our submarines don't work. Of course, there is an easy way to handle this. What's that? Tell the press you have evidence that the US sank the Wushan. That way China will have to deal with the US, and they will think twice before striking. Then we'll have the US on our back, and Diane is very fond of the First Lady. She pops over to New York to meet her. You know, they go shopping together. Elsie wears a false wig and a hat, and they go shopping as ordinary shoppers. They still have security, though. 
I'm sorry if world events are overshadowing your domestic arrangements, but lives are at stake. Y yes, of course. Uh, what evidence are you talking about? We'll make it up. The British government is not going to make up evidence that might lead to war. We are certainly not going to condemn the US. They're our closest ally. We're not going to blame the US and we are not abandoning Australia. So what are you going to do? Do you have a plan? Yes, of course we have a plan. Is it the same as our plan? I don't know. What is your plan? Tell me your plan and I'll tell you mine. You tell me your plan first. You did call me, you know. Well, here's what I think you should do. You have been listening to Overpopulation. Next scene, scene six. Don't jump.